Let me start with a chant in the traditional way and then we proceed. Uh, today we don't have much, it's about an hour, so we have a chit chat and then uh, tomorrow onwards we take it very seriously. Morning, huh? um, let me start the chant. This is an ancient Sanskrit chant. I'll do a couple of them. Uh, they have an, uh, a relationship to the subject under uh, study, which we are going to study. And as Subhash said, <coughs> I decided that we will have um, something called uh, exploring consciousness, mind, body and beyond based on the Upanishads and the Yoga Shastras. So I know some of you must have come more to learn Kriya Yoga than to hear all about consciousness. The other day somebody said, so you want to study about consciousness? He said, I know all about consciousness. I wake up in the morning, I'm quite conscious. <laughs> so I'm sure many people would be interested in Kriya. So don't worry, um, we will carry on with the theory first, kind of understanding, and from theory we will go to intuition beyond theory, and from there the practicals which uh, need to work on our system so that we can understand this personally. So that is the part where Kriya comes into the picture. So definitely, I assure you before you go, those who haven't taken Kriya will have Kriya, don't worry about it. And those who already had Kriya from me and who very studiously and uh, courageously don't practice it at all, they, they will also have a review <laughs> of the Kriya. So that uh, while we uh, study, the new, while the new people study Kriya, the old people who have already taken it, there are some people here who taken several years ago, some people recently, uh, so they will also get a review. Hmm? So, let me start. Sarve bhavantu sukinaha, sarve santu niramaya, sarve bhadrani pasyantu, ma kaschittu kapad bhavet, Loka samasta sukino bhavantu. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamaduchati Purnasya Purnamataya Purnameva Vasishyati. Om Brahmanandam Paramasugadam Kevalam Yanamurtim Dvandvaditam Gagana Satarsham Tatvamasya Dilaksham Ekam Nityam Vimalamachalam Sarvadi Sakshi Bhutam Bhavatitam Trigunarahitam Sadgurum Tamnama. Basically, it said, uh, may the whole world be happy. To sum up, that's all it means with all this. May the whole world be happy, may we see all that is auspicious, may nobody suffer. And this was the prayer, first prayer. And the second one, of course, was, which we will discuss as we go on. Purnamada Purnamidam, it's about fullness. And then the last one is going down to the Supreme Teacher, who is beyond the understanding of the ordinary mind. But then, of course one understands it, when the mind is not just ordinary, but slightly more than ordinary. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so this is what we are going to do today. Just now we'll just kind of warm up and from tomorrow I'm going to take the Upanishad and go into it step by step and I want to do the Mundaka Upanishad for you to start with and then uh, from there proceed. When you sit down to meditate, so meditation is also included. How we sit down, what we do, and what for are we meditating? These are also some of the issues that we are going to discuss. 
today, tomorrow, day after. Okay. So, this question of understanding or dwelling into the consciousness. I have to have a, we are sitting in a Buddhist center here and uh, it's a Buddhist monastery actually. I want to tell you something very interesting which happened in Delhi, New Delhi, when uh, just before my uh, walk across India, uh, I was meeting as many people as possible and talking to them and sharing my views and taking blessings and so on and so forth. Uh, and well, everybody needs blessings. So it so happened that His Holiness the Dalai Lama was there in Delhi. So I sent somebody to figure out if I could meet him in some way. Uh, so he said yes. Uh, so he also wanted a copy of my autobiography in English. So we got everything ready and I went and he was staying in the Taj Man Singh. It so happened that I was also staying there. So we went and uh, many things we don't have to go into this. We need to only discuss what is relevant to us, in, to our topic. Um, well, for one thing, when I was entering uh, down the stairs and enter the door, it was interesting because uh, I was quite uh, shocked because he was waiting at the door with his assistant, his interpreter, of the room. So I was wearing shoes. So I said, but Your Holiness, I would have come inside. He said, it's okay, come on. Then I, I was wearing shoes, so I was taking off my shoes. He said, but I'm wearing shoes. I said, that's okay, but I will take off my shoes. So I, we went inside. And then we walked, talked about uh, that walk and gave him the book. Um, he asked me about where did you travel in the Himalayas? What did you do? And uh, first he tried to discourage me from the walk. He said, oh, th oh, throughout India you're going to walk? It's going to be terrible, you'll have pain. And I said, no, I'm fine, thank you. Then he said, okay, I invoke the blessings of the Bodhisattvas. <laughs> then we came on to the subject of the Upanishads. Now, in f after this I thought, many diplomats waiting, people waiting outside, so let me clear out. Why trouble somebody? So I said, so a lot of people are waiting, so let me go. He caught my hand and put me down. He said, Nobody is waiting for me. Sit down. Okay, I said. <laughs> so I sat down. And then uh, there was a good friend of mine who was also close to him, who was with his camera. I said, what happened to you? I don't see you clicking. So, uh, anyway. And then... Uh, we were talking about the Upanishads. We are going to deal with this. This is why he brought up the subject. And also because we are in a Buddhist monastery. Well, my understanding is that there is no intrinsic core difference in the teachings for the Upanishads and the Buddhist teaching. There is no core. There are external differences, of course, because of various factors. But because Buddha himself was a rebel. Right. So, but, so we were talking about that and he said, suddenly he asked me from the blue, ah, I heard you, you teach the Upanishads. I said, yes, Your Holiness, I try to, I said. Uh -huh. And he said, uh, so can you tell me something? I said, mm, I was hesitating, I, I said, okay. So I said, there is an Upanishad called the Keno Upanishad. Hmm? It's kind of my favorite because it's one Upanishad which starts with the question, who? So, the identity crisis is 2000 years old, it's nothing new. <laughs> the question is, who? <laughs> who are you? What am I? Who? So, the very word, who, sorry, keno, is in Sanskrit, who? It means who. So, you can translate in English language as who Upanishad. Like, so, I said, there is a wonderful statement in this Upanishad which says, among other things, many things, it says, in manasana manyute anahur mano matam tadeva brahmatvam vidhvi nedam yad didam upasate. 
I said, to say that again. So, uh, uh, so I uh, said slowly in Sanskrit, I got it, he said, got it. Then he said, okay, so I know what you're saying. I said, I'm not saying, open it. Ah, okay, Upanishad is saying that that supreme reality that we seek, I said, here I'm going to translate it also as the supreme nirvana that you seek, whichever that you seek cannot be touched even by the mind. Huh? Cannot be touched even by the mind. Eyes, okay, because it starts with you can't see it with your eyes, you can't hear it with your ears and so on, but also lastly the mind. You can't, in manasa namanyute, the mind cannot understand it. Anahur mano matam, because of which the mind functions. Because the mind's origin is that, therefore the mind cannot understand it. Tadeva brahmatvam vidvi, that alone is the supreme reality. Nedam yad idam upasat, nothing that you worship here. It's a sweeping statement, of course, from the Upanishad. So he said, just a minute. If the mind also cannot understand it, and the only instrument we have is the mind, so what is it to me? It can be there and I can be here. I have nothing to do with it. Good question. If even the mind cannot, what is all this thing we are doing? Because we only have mind as an instrument. What other instrument do we have? Apart from the senses. It's been proved that senses cannot find it. Okay. Now the mind, if the mind. So I said, Your Holiness, as I understand it, as taught to me by my Guru, my Sonat Bhavati, it means the ordinary mind cannot understand. He said, then you should specifically say that the ordinary mind cannot understand it. Don't say, but I said, I didn't say that is in the Upanishad. Yes, but when you interpret it, you make, make sure that you make people understand that it is the ordinary. Because if it's not, then what is all the preparation that we do for the mind? Which means we are preparing to make the mind above ordinary, extraordinary. And then perhaps it gets a glimpse of what that is. So this is the exploring of consciousness that we are going to do from the Upanishadic point of view, but also from all points of view. Uh, I don't want to go into it in detail, but if you look into the wisdom teachings of all religions, ancient religions, the religions that cause the problem, not the spiritual content. If you go in, uh, let's start with the Upanishads we discussed just now. And then just after the Upanishads come the Buddhist teachings. In India I'm talking about. There are others, ancient teachings are there, the Jewish teachings also. But we'll come to that. So, mm, a, and I'm sure many of you must have studied some Vedanta and have probably heard of Shankaracharya. Yeah. There was a man called Adi Shankaracharya, uh, who in a way was a missionary, of course, because he was very much for the Hindu cause in some way. Uh, I think if Shankaracharya was not there, uh, India might have been a Buddhist country today. Good or bad, I don't know, but would have been. Uh, because that was a time when the Buddhist teachings had deteriorated a little bit, and Shankara was trying to steer clear and make it pure. And he was a man who walked all the way across India and established different ashrams in different places. And he was such a great expert. By the time he was 12, he had mastered the Vedas and the Upanishads. So he must be a genius. Can't be ordinary. Not an ordinary mind. So, uh, his, uh, one of his theories was, no rituals, no external things are, can take you to the Supreme Truth. You need to have Viveka and Vairagya. You, one of his wonderful texts is called the Viveka Chudamani, the crest jewel of wisdom, in which he says, look, I am neither a Shankarite nor a Buddhist. We are just discussing it. 
I'm a humanist. Okay. So, what he was trying to discuss is that no kind of ritual, whatever we do, you know, in those days, even today we do a lot of, tomorrow we are going to light a fire. It is a ritual. Okay. So, that's fine for a certain purpose. But that is not going to lead you to the supreme truth. This was his, one of his major theories. And so therefore, he said, there are two things required. If you need to crack it, one is viveka, which is discrimination. And the other is vairagya, which means non-attachment, non-possessiveness. Two things, vairagya and viveka. If you don't have these two, he said, you can have yogic powers, but you will not touch the truth. So, um, when he started his preaching, and he, in fact, by the age of 30, he was gone. He went to Badrinath, Kedar, and then nobody knows where he went. Uh, in this long, short period, he did a lot of work. When he uh, reached Banaras, you know, Varanasi. You know, Varanasi is a center of orthodoxy in many ways, even today in many ways. Of course, there is the temple of, the main temple of Shiva, who is supposed to be the king of yogis, the chief of yogis, uh, Yogeshwara, and also the king of dancers. This is very interesting. Shiva is also called Nataraja, king of all dancers, mm, chief of dancers. So, but there in Varanasi he doesn't dance, he sits quietly in the lake. So, when Shankara was preaching in Banaras, the orthodoxy heard him and said, Oh my God, no, this guy, he has come to destroy your religion. We do all these things. This is part of our religion and he's come to destroy this religion of ours. And they labeled him a Prachanna Bautika, which means a Buddhist in disguise. <laughs> the man was so... In core he was in the Upanishadic teachings, but they found it very convenient to label him as a Buddhist in disguise. Now, if they had to label him a Buddhist in disguise, that means the teachings of Shankara were going so close to the teachings of the Buddhist, of the Buddhist teachings that they could easily kind of turn it around and say, oh, he's a Buddhist in disguise. So what I'm trying to say is that the search for Nirvana, looking for Nirvana, and the search for Moksha in Vedanta are not two things. Basically, they, when, you, when anybody who experiences, well, what the Buddha was trying to do is steer clear of the orthodoxy. He got so fed up that he said, let our scriptures not be in Sanskrit. So they were all written in Prakrit. But if you look at the teachings, analyze them, look at them, then you see that the core is no different. In Vedanta, the supreme reality has no definitions. Nirvana has no definitions. In Vedanta, the supreme reality is reached when you have moksha, freedom. Nirvana is ultimate freedom. Different words. Well, what about yoga? Patanjali uses a very mm, distinct word for this. Instead of moksha, he says kaivalya. It's a very interesting word. Kaivalya comes from the Sanskrit root kevalam, only. Which means, a person who has touched that is kind of alone in the sense that there is nothing else except that, the core of one's existence. And when that is discovered, there are no many, there is only one. So these are some of the things that, these are the some of my favorite things that we are going to go into. And uh, <coughs> you are free to ask questions, but at the end, not in the beginning. If you ask me questions in the beginning, then uh, 
we will only have questions, no answers. So after a session, for instance, or when we have time for questions, then we will take up the questions and discuss them. Now, on this subject, I need to tell you that this is a satsang. So being a satsang, we are a group of people trying to find the truth. You and I. It's not as if, I'm not going to say that I, I'm going to, at least I'm not going to pretend that I know. And uh, that you don't know. It's not that way. We are going to be at par and try to look at this problem together. We have a beautiful sloka which is chanted before a satsang. First, what is a satsang? I think what is a satsang, we will discuss tomorrow, because when we do the Upanishad. Uh, the study of the Upanishad is satsang, so we'll go into that tomorrow. But what is the mantra chanted before a satsang, generally? I'm sure many people from India might know it, many from outside India might know it. It's a very popular thing. It says, Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Garavavai Tejasvina Vadi Tamastuma Vidvishava. Hmm? Means. Okay. Please note, I'm, I'm kind of introducing you to what we are going to do tomorrow day after. What is the um, relationship between you and me in this study that we are going to do? I'm not going to say anything and say believe it and you're, I'm open to questions. Uh, questions relating to the subject, not politics. But So, <clears throat> if you notice carefully, you will see that the first three lines have one common word. When I chant, Sahana Bhavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahaviryam Karavavai, Saha. Now, when you say Saha, it automatically means you and me. Cannot be only you, or cannot be only me. Two. So, so it, it goes, Sahana Vavatu, may you and I, I could have said I and you, but let's say you and I, be protected. Starts with that. Protected. By protected. Physical protection, of course. In the ancient times, these were studied in the forest, in caves and so on, or in the forest academies. So you needed protection, physical protection. Apart from that, there is also what you call mind protection. When you are unpointedly trying to understand something, the mind runs here and there. There are other attractions coming up. So all these together assault our mind and don't allow it to move on the path of inquiry. Therefore, appeal to be protected. To whom we don't know, but to the Supreme, let's say, something. Um, so, I'm saying this because it can't be defined. Something. Or no thing. It's not nothing, but no thing. Thing. So, Om Sahana Vavatu, may we both be protected. Yet the study of Vedanta, exploration of consciousness, is nothing to do with building your career, okay? Most of the emails I get is, I have lost a job, please help me. In India, it's a terrible thing to be a guru. Somebody has constipation, they'll ask you for help. Okay, so may both of us be protected. Sahana Bhavatu. Sahana Bhunaktu. May both of us be nourished. Nourished with physical, of course, food, nourishment, nutrients, and then mental nourishment, which we need, and then spiritual nourishment. So it's not that I want to be nourished, you and I, both. And then, Sahviryam Karavavahe. 
may the virya, the virility, the energy in both of us increase. Hmm? We need virility, we need energy. You're going to study something so serious, it needs full attention and a lot of energy to study. Can't be a hobby. Meditation and study of consciousness cannot become a hobby. You need to study it and you, you need fuel. In the ancient times, when a student went to a teacher to understand this truth, they, they say they carry the fuel in their hand. Which doesn't mean you light a fire out and take it there as fuel. It means you go with your all your energy and say, here I am with all my energies intact. Now teach me how to find, apply it to find the truth. So, virya, energy is required. And then, tejas vinavadi tamastu. May the tejas, tejas is the spiritual energy in you and me. May it become abandoned. May it rise and become abandoned. And the last one is Ma Vidvisha Vahai May we not fight with each other. Hmm? Now when you say not fight with each other, it means it's a distinguishing between a debate between a dialogue and an argument. The Bhagavad Gita is a dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna. Although most of the time Krishna is talking. But then Arjuna doesn't let him go easily. For instance, when Krishna says in the sixth chapter, which is called the Yoga of Meditation, Dhyana Yoga, he says, Oh, your mind should be made like a flame when there is no wind and so on. So Arjuna says, just a minute. He didn't say just a minute, I am saying. He said, hold on, hold on. Now you are saying that the mind should be like a flame without wind. It's so easy for you to say, it's not possible for me. Frankly, he says, it's easier to control the wind than to stop the mind. <laughs> so tell me what to do. And then it continues. <laughs> you know, it continues. So, uh, so why did I say that? Then <laughs> hmm? Don't fight with each other. That is the peace mission, huh? <laughs> Yes. The difference between an argument and the di- I'm not losing my memory, okay? <laughs> this man hasn't come today. I have a good friend in the US, so he sees all my YouTubes and videos and then he sends me an email saying, Sir, I think you're becoming senile. He's a doctor. <laughs> So, um, I, I love you very much. So, here is the list of medicines you better take. <laughs> Neurobion or something, I don't know what. Uh, so, then they, uh, so I, I send him back an email saying, My friend, I'm perfectly alright. <laughs> My brain is perfectly clear, there's no problem. I want others to know, I want to know what others are thinking or are they just sleeping here, you know. So, when you ask, then they wake up and uh, if you're asleep. Otherwise, I'm sure you're not. <laughs> uh, we're all in Jagrata Avastha, not in Sushupti. So. Mm. so anyway, so it is for distinguishing between an argument and a dialogue. So, what they are trying to say is, see, what is an argument? I have concluded that this is correct. Mm. And I want to push it down your throat. And you have concluded, no, this is not, that is correct. So that is correct and this is correct. Come together and there is a clash. So there is no understanding. Then what is a dialogue? A dialogue is when you and I sit together, for the time being keep away all those things that we have gathered. Over the years we gather a lot of things, right? I do, you do. And then putting them aside, we say, okay, Let's look at this, this question of consciousness. Can we look at it as if you are looking at it in a new way? 
in a fresh way, keeping away all that luggage. Put your backpacks away. Sit down. These are not backpacks, these are head packs. And then, <laughs> and then can we look at this together? This is very important when you are doing things, for instance, studying things like Vedanta. Very, very important. You know what happens generally? Happens to everybody. I'm not blaming. I'm, I'm just saying the truth. It happens. Suppose I say, well, the inner spark of us and the Supreme Reality are the same in the sense that it's like a spark from the fire. Now, sometimes we listen. Yeah, okay. Sometimes, you know, the mind goes, it says, oh, but, uh, you know, Swami Chinmayananda said something. I'm not talking about him. I'm just saying an example. He was a good friend of mine. He was much older than me. Anyway, said something. Or Swami Shivananda said something. Okay, and now M is saying something. Okay, so there is a comparison. So there's nothing wrong in comparing. But what happens to the mind is then the mind is not listening. So there is no full energy. Half the mind is. Co- is this what he said? Is this the same or is it different? So we are saying, the time being, for the time being, can we set things aside and sit together like good boys and girls? Huh? Trying to look at the problem together. If we do that, then I am sure you can go out and then compare. No harm. I mean, you can sit here and compare also. That's okay. But I'm trying, what I'm trying to say, then you lose a lot of attention and energy. It can happen other way around also. Because I've been having so many satsangs now. People who have been listening to me for many years may also, when I say something, say, but he said something that time. Is it the same as what he's saying now? It need not be two people. See? So, can we, as we proceed, sit together like good friends? You know, like two good friends sitting on a bench in the park somewhere and looking at something, looking at a beautiful lady. No, 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 let's not do that. Looking at somebody passing and say, now let's study this phenomenon. <laughs> what is this all about? <laughs> hmm? So then what happened when both of us understand even if I knew it, if I say this is what it is, it really won't register. I have to come down, if I know, if. Come down to where you stand and hold your hand and then both of us can walk together. And when you go there, aha, now I see it, ah, this I have seen it before. So this is what we are going to do today. Um, what I'm going to do is tomorrow, as soon as we, we have a meditation in the morning. Tomorrow's meditation, you can meditate as you like. I'm not going to impose anything on you. But later on, we will do uh, some kind of meditation, which we are going to learn. Um, and then we come to the first session, and I'm going to open the Upanishad called the Mundaka Upanishad. And Mundaka means shaven. The, the monks shave their heads, right? Um, but nowadays I see lots of young people with shaven heads. Right? Seems to be a trend. Huh? So, uh, and the monk shaves his head, which means he is free of all uh, pretensions. Uh, when you have hair, then you have to keep it there. Nothing, all gone. Mm-hmm. So, Mundaka means shaven head. It was meant for those who have dumped all ideas and want to look at the truth, clear. And we are, and it's, it begins with a dialogue, beautiful dialogue. So I'm going to, if you don't mind, as I do that, I'm going to chant, I'm going to do it in Sanskrit first and then translate it. Is it okay? Or do you want me to do in English? We won't waste time, I promise. It will take only half a minute more. 
and then if I see people are getting bored, then I'll just go on translating it. Uh, because the impact of the in that language is something different from uh, the, it's the sound also, not so much the meaning as the sound. Now I said about Vedanta and Buddhist teachings and so on. We kind of uh, skimmed over them, not gone deep in. So what about other religions? Huh? Is there something like that, any stream in these religions? The problem, as I see it, is not so much the spiritual content of the religion as the external shell that has accrued over the years. There is the fault. Uh, there was a great uh, Sufi teacher who was the founder of a very important Sufi order. It's called the Nakshabandi order. His name was Bahaudin Nakshband. He said something very interesting. He said, if you see a Sufi order existing for 200 years, like you, you can be sure that there's only the shell, the core has vanished. Sweeping statement to make. So, when the outer becomes more important, that is where the problems come, not, you know what I mean. And because, you look into any religious movement, it starts with the mystic who had some experience. Right. Then, depending, and he's gone after some time. And then, depending upon who takes over, they have imperialistic designs, they have other designs, and then it's constructed in such a way that it looks like it's doing something else altogether. This is where the problem comes. I'm, I must repeat this. I have repeated this story a number of times, but it's very interesting to note carefully. So, even when we are doing Vedanta, please and remember that. Don't stand at the shell, go to the court. Don't. Uh, so, this is about the devil and his friend who went for a walk. I'm very mm, fond of repeating the story. It's, in fact, the story, I, I got it from J. Krishnamurti, with whom also I spent some time. Babaji told me, last thing, go to Krishnamurti. I said, why? He said, go. So I went. Uh, he was very fond of the story. He said, uh, a devil and his close friend went for a walk. So, uh, happily they were walking and the devil, Satan, <coughs> bent down and picked up something from the grass and put it in his pocket. So, his friend said to him, hey, what have you picked up just now? He said, I have picked up the truth. So, his friend said, then your days are numbered. That's your end. Because you are the opposite of truth, you are untruth, you are darkness. So if you picked up the truth, it's light and you put it in your pocket, you are finished now. Your day is a number. The devil tapped him on his shoulder and said, Hey, don't worry friend, I'll organize it. <laughs> so, you see what I'm trying to say? This is where it, it happens everywhere. It happens in Islam, it happens in Christianity, it happens in... I don't want to say it happens in Hindu, it happens everywhere. They ought. And then the core is lost. So this is why we should constantly keep this in mind and go to the root <coughs> scriptures which teach, the texts, so that we are not misled. So that no one can take us for a ride. See that? So now we see the, the ancient Jewish scriptures. This, I mean, UK, um, whenever I go, I meet uh, uh, very important rabbis who come from, also from London and from Jerusalem and so on. Because we are planning to have a peace walk in Jerusalem next year. Hmm. Dangerous thing, everybody says, but uh, with the cooperation of the government and also the other side. So, we had a very serious meeting about this matter discussed. Uh, <clears throat> there's a nice cafeteria in the House of Lords. We sat there and discussed it. Uh, so we were talking about the various things and 
one person who is a very senior person in Jerusalem, in their circles, he was the main person who was supposed to organize it. So we were having a chat and I was talking about the Brahman and so on. So actually after the Nehru Center talk, you must have noticed he was sitting in the front row, Isaac. So um, <clears throat> I said, so that the supreme reality which is described in the Upanishads is something which the senses cannot perceive and yet which can be intuited by the mind, which has grown, which has expanded. And therefore, it's also said in Sanskrit, yad vajana bhutitam, that which words cannot describe. That which words cannot describe. So actually we are wasting time, we are trying to use words. Anyway, so <laughs> that which words cannot describe. Uh, and, def- and then he's, he, he suddenly said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm going to look back into my tradition. He says, the ultimate supreme reality is unutterable. Why unutterable? Because whatever you utter, fall short. He said there are four four letters. He said they are unutterable. I'll as well say it. Jodhe Vahe. He said the four letters which are unutterable which represent the Supreme Reality. I said, and then he said, it sounds like it is the same thing you are talking about when you said, words cannot express it. No words can express it. I said, yes. so, this session is going to be over in five minutes. Okay. So, go settle down, we start tomorrow. Before that, I need to tell you a nice little story. Hmm? About this, not something else to waste time. Anyway, there is no time actually to waste time. Mm, is there time? Uh, suppose you are interested in what is going on, then you think, oh, it's over. Suppose you are bored, stiff, say, why is this guy not stopping and we going on? Where is time? Anyway. So, <clears throat> a word of Shankara, Adi Shankara. So when Shankara, she was saying Akala means one without time. Um, When Shankara was uh, walking in the south of India, uh, he came to a village and Shankaracharya, not the present Shankaracharya, the first one. And there he, uh, a family was waiting for him who said, Sir, can you please come home? Why? He said, we have a boy, you know, our only son. He's eight years old. He's not uttered a word. Doesn't speak. Maybe he's dumb. We don't know. Maybe he's possessed. He's sitting in a corner of the room always like this. So, they invited him respectfully to come. Maybe you put your hand on his head. Something might happen. So, Shankara went. And he, the story is that he found this boy in the corner of the room sitting like this. So he went to him and he asked him, Why don't you talk? The first time the boy spoke, he said, About what? <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, Before Shankara could say anything, he said, The truth cannot be expressed in words. So whatever I say is a lie. So I prefer to remain silent. So Shankara said, Yes, I was looking for you. Come, let's go. And he became a very close disciple of his. And Shankara named him Hasta Malaka. When Hasta is a hand, Amalka is the gooseberry fruit. He said, This is a guy who kept entire knowledge of Vedanta in his fist, like a gooseberry, like a fruit. So, after all this talk, we are going to go actually into that which cannot be talked about, which is silence. 
even ordinary things. If somebody says, how much do you love me, what can you say? Tons? Can you measure it? This is ordinary, so imagine that. So this is what we are going to look at. And I, I assure you, I'll try to keep it as not boring as possible. But I can't guarantee that. Because, uh, and at the end of the satsang, please, if you have questions, put up your hands uh, and then we can discuss the matter. Uh, I wouldn't say we can sort it out immediately, but at least there will be food for thought. Go home and think in your rooms. Okay? Yes? So, for today, it's one hour. The other reason why I do it, tomorrow I'm going to do many hours, but why I do this one hour, you know. After one hour, usually such things, you know, thinking of various things, uh, you know, to go back to my room. <laughs> we have parked the car there, who knows. And we just fact. So, now this was an introduction. I was introducing myself to you uh, so that you know what you're dealing with. Perfectly harmless <laughs> and non-dangerous. But let me warn you that the truth is dangerous. Very dangerous. Because when you touch the bare truth, you break many images. The Mundaka Upanishad, which we are going to do tomorrow, has a beautiful expression for that. He said, going towards the truth is like walking on the edge of a razor. Chura Siddhara, edge of a razor. You don't know where you're going to fall, cut your feet, be careful, light, carefully. So, this is what we are going to do. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Hari Om Tat Sat. Over, circus is over. <laughs> <laughs> For today. <laughs> <laughs>